Okay, so that brings us now to uh, the album's title track, which I've always, I, I love a title track. I think it always mm. uh, plays to an album in a fun way because people are like, what's the, what's the significance there? You know? I, I was thinking in my head, do we have any other records with a title track? Last Young Renegade. Yeah, no. I was going to say kind of nothing personal, but not really. Yeah. There's, not, a there's not a song on there called There's not a song on there, but. Uh, never done it until Last Young Renegade. And now we're going to get two in a row. Two wow. in a row. We just got lazy with naming albums, really. Yeah, hey, the, hey, we haven't gotten as far as the self-titled yet, so we're good, I think. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's, always, that's always the, uh, usually it's the, the band's best record, but also it's like the one where you can tell they're just like, fuck it. Um, yeah, so, so Wake Up Sunshine would have been technically the first song written yes. for this record, right? I mean, that's what makes this whole thing kind of interesting because we, I wrote this song with... Um, my buddy, our buddy, Colin Britton, uh, about, wow, I guess like even maybe a year before we even started writing music for this album. Um, and at the time, it was written more around the time of like, everything is fine and birthday. Right. Uh, it was in that, those sessions. And Colin uh, produced our last album, for those of you who don't know, Last Young Renegade, um, and did a phenomenal job. And then we, we went on to write a bunch more songs, some of which saw the light of day and some didn't. And what was we weird and interesting about this one is it just, I remember every conversation we had about a potential future album, I would always reference this song. I was always like, there's something about it. There's something yeah. about it. There's something about it. And we just, it never quite connected until about halfway through making this album. This record. When I circled back to it again, we had, a, <clears throat> we had kind of the first listening to a bunch of songs with our label. And I was like, in that moment, I was like, I got to play him this song because I just feel like it fits in the batch. And we played it and they were like, our A&R, Johnny was like, hmm, what's the deal with that one? Where's the, where'd that come from? And it like opened up this whole thing. And then so suddenly I'm like texting Colin again and being like, dude, we got to dig up this song because it's, it's, it fits. So without further ado, everyone, Colin Britton, let's bring him in. Let's talk hey, about boy. Hey, wow, hey, boy. Hey, boy. Hey. hey. From What's up? It's like the big. It's like the big reveal. <laughs> the reveal. First, thank you for writing the song with me that would go on to explain this entire goddamn album that we didn't know we were writing at the time. And uh, I think that's that's amazing and also awesome. Yeah, that it's like full circle. Yeah, totally. It was just it was so strange because we like we dove in so far and we had this like all these songs written for what would eventually be um, "Wake Up Sunshine" the album, and then it just like this song just made too much sense and i remember hitting you up and being like hey do you still have that session can we pop yeah. that open for a minute yeah right and uh you know it was it that was, was my favorite one of um or one of my favorite ones certainly from that batch that we were doing like post um last young renegade because you and i were working for like you know off and on just like for like a year just kind of like every once in a while you pop by and we just jam for a little bit yeah and so we had mass kind of like i felt like quite a few songs that were just sort of random and um that one was cool because it was kind of remember is like you were on like some oasis kind of tip very much at that so. point <laughs> which was awesome <laughs> you was, can like, always tell like bands. which era alex is in like when he when he comes out of a couple like writing sessions he's like i got some songs and you're like oh i know you've been listening to yeah <laughs> yeah hey uh yeah for sure i was like very much feeling like the it kind of it's funny now when you look at it in comparison to like a song like birthday which was written around the same time because that mm. also has that very sort of like cake back yeah 90s thing going for it as well and i was very much in a 90s frame of mind which i think translated over into some of the songs on this sure record. But, but yeah man like that was that was a fun one i remember you had that riff and uh i, I mean yeah like what i'm it, it's helpful that you're here because we wrote that one so long ago like what were some of the things that we were doing on that song i mean again kind of a weird bridge of a very the bridge, strange yeah. departure mm -hmm. yeah um i remember that like the first comments we got back from uh a and r on that one was like which i guess was different a and r than than johnny mm -hmm. currently but we were like it was like um oh yeah that it's too like rock and roll or something like that 
and uh, or too like old <laughs> old school, like the progression's like too old school, and we were kind of like we were both like hell yeah, huh. yeah, that's like <laughs> that kind is. of the vibe. That's right? the vibe, like, yeah. And he was like, no, but that's that's not. What and we're so doing. so like we went and we we went like kind of full circle because I tried like a bunch of different shit on it, that, you know, to kind of like try to make different guitar parts and stuff, and it was just I think that's when it kind of got a little murky. So then we went back to the original way, which is how it turned out, which yeah. is great. Um, well, so yeah. it goes back to what we, we, you were saying last week, Alex, or last, you know, about the other songs where like, if you try to change a song too much and like go back and like, you know, change yeah. it, it just, you lose, you lose what's so special about it. And yeah. that's what it's important. Sometimes just go back to the original kind of idea, the original spark. I was going to say for drums, recording drums on that one was a different experience for me in that same vein in that it was kind of just, um, you know, we had spent so much time with Servini uh, building these drum tracks for the other songs and like programming the drums kind of like exactly what I was going to play. And then for Wake Up Sunshine, it was kind of just like, I listened to it like three or four times in the control room. And then I just went out and played it like two or three times. And, and there was no real punching. There was no punching is like when you just do a specific take for you listeners, um, like, you know, play that fill again perfectly. It was just kind of like get in there and kind of like Dave Grohl it a little bit and just kind of smash some drums, um, which I think serviced the song because the song as a whole does have kind of like a rough around the edges feel and like a, a, live, a live feel to it. And um, yeah, it was a really fun one to, to play drums on because of that different vibe. I think also what's beautiful about this song is because it was created in a slightly different frame of mind and different era, um, it kind of mashes. And also, I mean, obviously something that the viewers don't know right now, but like, so Colin, we had a version of this song with Colin that was in existence for a year before we even made this record. And then we sort of remade it with Zach to kind of have it. We had to like, took a bunch of what Colin already did and then sort of like, uh, revamped it to fit the sonic palette of like yep. the new music. So it's actually this really, Wake Up Sunshine is the most interesting sonically because it's this weird hybrid of like some stuff we did closer to Last Young Renegade and then smashed together with what we were doing on this record. So it's very cool to see sort of like both of your production cues kind of yeah. married together on this song. Like Zach, do you want to speak a little bit to like how you uh, took what me and Colin already had and like adapted it because I think there's something very interesting to that. Yeah, it's it's kind of interesting actually because Colin and I have been friends for a long time and we actually used to work together years and years ago. So we kind of knew how each other worked and whatnot. And this kind of made me, it was kind of like taking it back to the past. And, and it was, it's kind of the way that we did things back in the day. Totally. Was that yeah, there, yeah sure. there would be, yeah, Colin would kind of, you know, write and structure a song and stuff and then do the production and get all the ideas together and everything and then he would hand it off to me and i would then do the back half of it and finish it off and just make sure that sonically and whatnot it was in line with how it needed to sound for whatever the end goal was or whatever record or project it was for and this was basically was a version of that um colin's production was already amazing on this so we just took that version of it and just basically put this put the sounds that we had been using for the rest of the record on this song just to make it fit with everything else essentially and it was it was seamless i remember this this was one of the most seamless songs i remember we were in the drum studio and literally we finished drums for like 17 songs or something in like two days <laughs> And Alex was like, let me text Colin and see if he's got that wake up sunshine yeah. sound. And then literally he played it through the speakers and like like twice and Ryan just went in and just did it real quick. And then Alex and Jack came to, the, to my studio the next day for like four hours or so. And we just honestly just finished it off right there. What, so, what stands out to me cool. about this song um, is, and this is, partially my fault but when me and alex had gotten in to finish the song off with you that day after ryan did drums i was like hell bent on putting a uh like an octave part or a lead part in the intro you remember that mm -hmm. i was like yeah, you wanted you wanted some kind of like like riff or some kind riff. of thing yeah we tried so many different we, iterations for like three hours we just sat there <laughs> trying like all these different guitar parts and and nothing worked so um we, we eventually just ended up taking the taking the lyric from the pre-chorus and the one that's in the in the middle of the first verse and just kind of paste it in the yeah, uh, well, intro yeah. the mm -hmm. mm -hmm. are you living well. are you living well line yeah. mm -hmm. i love um, that i love that song something else too i'll throw in is that i was just thinking about is that um one of my favorite oasis songs is um this song called the shock of lightning 
Yeah. And I think that's kind of what we got like the energy from. Um, and it was actually kind of a mono mix. So which yeah. for those who don't know, that means that like everything instead of like left and right, it's it's all in one. You can play it on one speaker and it, it sounds the same as if it was on two speakers. And so that's like kind of a really hard way of like recording, but also a really interesting way of doing it. And that's kind of what we started with. And I think that's kind of why like the song has such a power around that one chord. You know what I yeah. mean? And that's like, kind of like the, yeah, it's just like one of the, and the drums are really carrying it through and it just kind of rocks around that one chord for such a long time until the chorus. So that's one yeah, of the special was, things about this one for me. For sure. It was built to be like sort of this snotty, like basement feeling. Rock that's a great song. word for it snotty yeah, another it's, like, it's another odd bridge too we jump for what to six eight and we drop tempo quite a bit too right Servini? yeah that yeah, goes from 146 to 130 and then just back up to 146 oh yeah and there's that crazy bridge in there right the yeah the, a, the six yeah, eight gets, bridge gets yeah. Yeah. So we Beatles change time signatures <laughs> yeah and, and actually some of my favorite harmonies maybe on on like any production that i've i've ever been a part of is is uh coming out of that uh six eight bridge into the into the last chorus where you do those really beautiful like haunting uh harmonies is just such a moment. Here. Can we listen yeah, yeah let's check that out hello those boys out I like mm. pretty nice pretty nice I love the, the grit the grit in yeah. your voice but also oh, one thing that reminds me um Servini, correct me if I'm wrong, but this in this song, you or Alex wanted to like stack the harmony so that like each chorus had more harmonies than the one before it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It mm -hmm. felt like with this song, because of how sort of like snotty and gritty it was, the more we added to it, the more it felt like a bit linear when you did yeah. it right from the get go. So one of the really important production things with this song was to continue to stack and build as it went along rather than hitting you in the face with everything all at once which sometimes works for a song like you when you get to that chorus one you want everything to pop but in this case like the hook and the melody was enough in chorus one to just hear it pretty much with just the lead vocal and yeah. then as we build it and as we build it because it's a repetitious chorus it's nice to get that new harmonic information just for, to like Everlong, they did that in Everlong. Use your brain, yeah, yeah. It's the Everlong. Yeah. Actually, I remember now. Like, I think I had heard a version of this song during the process, the writing process of like everything is fine and birthday during that whole thing. Um, but the first time I had heard it during the process for Wake Up Sunshine, the record, was when we were doing some kind of disaster. We have that real like, if you listen to the last chorus of some kind of disaster, the last hit, it kind of like draws out with that really like eerie verb and stuff. And Alex, I remember originally you wanted that to go into the bridge of this song. So there's okay. a version of some kind of disaster out there that, you know, what do you after some kind of disaster and that kind of hangs on and then it like creepily drags into the bridge of this song. Yeah, and then somehow we were going to like meld those two and then it just never happened, obviously, because that would have been like a five minute first track. But <laughs> Well, now, <laughs> you've, now you've spoiled the concert experience for everyone because I was still going to do that live. Oh. <laughs> but, uh, we'll cut, we'll just cut it out. Don't forget by next year. Yeah, now you know. Now you know. I'm going to go ahead coming. and say, I think the next, you know, the next record needs to be two songs. Each of them are 20 minutes long. <laughs> Colin, thanks for joining us. That's all the time we have for you today. <laughs> Colin, I agree. Let's get to work. Our manager is like yeah. not on video right now. Like, cut it, cut it. Get him out of there. That guy doing it here. Uh, well, dude, thank you for uh, for stopping by on this, and thank you. Yeah, for, uh, of course. Being the being the, uh, the crux of inspiration for not only this song and the beginnings of this record, but ultimately, like the entire theme of the album. A big theme on this record was us working with our friends and very much being like insulated and, and really shutting out the outside world to make this album and, and really only working with like our trusted loved friends uh, and no one else. And it's, I love so much that like the very beginning of this thing goes back to, to you. It's, it's nice. Well, it's, I appreciate you guys having me. So, and also yeah. amazing album, by the way. It sounds, it sounds incredible, Zach. Thanks, great dude. job. Everybody, Thanks for being a part job, of it. So. All right, so Monsters, this is an exciting track to talk about because this one uh, felt like some serious magic happening for the record. Um, you get a good handful of those on every record, not to say that the other songs aren't also magic as hell, but there's like, there's always a small handful that just when you know, you know, and it kind of feels like you're being like, you're tapping into the, the greater 
creative cloud in the sky sort of thing. And the song is just being fed to you by and the, the, the music gods. Yeah. That's you a good way I mean? to say it, but also like it kind of happened so quickly. And yeah. that's kind of when you, when you know, like it's ha- when it happens so naturally, organically and just really fast and you're like, oh shit, this is really coming together. Yeah. I remember like songs back in our, our past, like Weightless and, um, you know, uh, The Reckless and the Brave and um, Something's Gotta Give as well, which uh, mm-hmm. brings me to one of the guys who worked on this song with us, Andrew Goldstein. Um, he had not been part of the process thus far. We were at the Marble Mansion in, uh, in Palm Desert, and he popped up a little bit later to uh, join us and got in for the day. We were working on a lot of other songs, I think, at this point. We had a bunch of songs rolling, and I think we spent sort of this day like doing a lot of house cleaning rather than writing. We were recording rhythm yeah. guitars, and Zach was tracking bass, and mm-hmm. um, we were sort of just yeah. going going through like building up other songs because we knew Andrew was going to come. And once Andrew got there, we'd probably start a new start something idea. new. Um, so yeah, Andrew Andrew w- showed up. Obviously, Kevin uh, had also come. Hey, there he is! Look at that! Look at wow. that. There he is! <laughs> Show up. Whoa, Whoa. Crazy guys! <laughs> and so uh, so. Yeah, like to, to give everybody watching a little bit of an idea of, of uh, how Andrew and Kevin fit into our um, lives in this band. Uh, we've known Andrew for a very, very long time. We played local shows together way, way back um, and have, you know, in high stayed, school. Yeah, stayed friends ever since. And um, we started working on music together years ago. Andrew uh, and I wrote songs like Something's Gotta Give and we worked on Good Times together and, you know, a bunch of all time low stuff. So Andrew has been very pivotal in especially recent years uh, of, of shaping uh, where All Time Low was going and progressing. And, um, and then Kevin, as I introduced, uh, or will introduce on the next song as well, uh, Kevin joined us uh, on our last record, wrote you know, some of my favorite songs that this band has ever done with us, uh, Life of the Party and um, Dark Side of Your Room and, and Songs in This Vein, and then went and, uh, went and started a damn band, a damn band with Jack, and they put out some sick music as well. Um, so, so he's really, he's, he's, he's in our atmosphere, you could say. He's got his fingers in all of us. Yeah, <laughs> he's got his fingers in all of us. Um, and yeah, so this, this song was very, <laughs> this song was very fun. It kind of felt very, very special very quickly. And um, it was nice to sort of at this point in the process have Andrew come in and bring like a fresh perspective and a fresh take. So I, I remember yeah. you like showing up that day and like listening to a bunch of the stuff that we had already done and you were like, all right, that's going to be easy to beat. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then, no, I'm kidding. He didn't say that. Um, but then like, he, but he thought it, but he thought it, we built this, <laughs> we built this, like, we built this like separate rig in the, Closet, in your closet the closet, closet of my yeah. bedroom and uh it like they i, I remember andrew just kind of like locked himself away <laughs> for a minute and started working on some new ideas I knew I was, speakers, I were, 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 the speakers were on an ironing board i wanted to go into the closet for sure <laughs> <laughs> and it was hashtag into the closet <laughs> i think like andrew kevin jack had sort of like locked themselves away and were working on some new ideas and me and Zach and Servini and Ryan were out in the other room uh, doing housework on these other songs and like building them up, recording rhythms. And just like, I, I was not in a creative mindset that day. Yeah. And I remember walking in and you guys had this track idea going for Monsters that was just like dark and kind of sultry, but also like hit real hard and just felt like something we hadn't really done yet on the album. It ha- we didn't Gold, have- yeah. We didn't have we didn't have a song yet, but Goldstein was kind of doing this riff and it changed, you know, we just kept playing it and, and looping it, but it would change it up a little bit. And I think they got to the point where like that's it, like stop. <laughs> like record that part because that's like so good. And you're talking and about the you- na 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 like the, the very mm-hmm. distinct yeah. melody lead line. And I remember having this interesting moment uh when I came in a little bit later to see what you guys were working on. I think you had sort of kicked around some melody ideas. I think you guys sort of had like a verse melody idea and stuff. We started singing or trying to sing some lyrics over your guitar line, your lead line. And I was like, well, what if that's the chorus? I mean, that's like the catchiest thing ever. Like, what if we just went there for the chorus? And I, it was kind of a nice like aha moment for everybody. I remember everyone was just sort of like, we all had that sort of revelation of like, oh yeah, clicked. that's like the obvious thing and it worked. And uh, I remember at that point we all sat down and started writing lyrics and that was really fun because it just, as I said, it sort of felt like we tapped into something like, 
uni- universal where like yeah. literally all of a sudden like we were just being given the song yeah it was very fast i think once alex came in and started singing that part we were all like oh that's that's the thing like that's we didn't even need to have that be the chorus because it was a musical part and then we finished kind of like the bones of the song like the bare bones and then gave it to zach and then once zach started messing with it we were like ooh. This is nice. I remember, I remember yeah. Alex, I, yeah, I, I like vaguely remember Alex singing the I don't mind if you fuck up my life. And like, we kind of were like, shit, that's like a Sia melody. That's really cool. So yeah, I remember that night Andrew got there. I actually like, we'd been like working, working for like two weeks straight or so. And yeah. so I like, so I, w- I actually went to bed and it was like, you guys started this song at like midnight or something. I just yeah. remember like lying in bed at 1 a.m hearing Alex sing that chorus over and over from across the house. And like, even from that, I was like, this is sick. It was kind of cool creatively too, to see, uh, you know, in the same way that we had Phil sort of working as as, as like two producers at once. um, It was kind of cool to have you come in, Andrew, and like you, we built this track from nothing and then to pass it on to Zach to like shape into sort of the soundscape of the other songs that we've been working on. And it took on this really interesting um new life with your both of your productions coming together i remember like we hadn't done anything with like clean jangly guitars the way the hook mm-hmm. on this is and that all came from your demo and we were like we're not there's no way we're re-recording that because it sounds so signature and like unlike it sounded somehow it's like very small if you solo it out but it's it sounds yeah, can we massive. solo it out real quick when you hear yeah, that yeah. chorus it sounds huge it's, yeah. it's but it's huge. actually i don't think there's a distorted guitar that is a session Large yeah, you yeah you can see what happens when a couple producers produce the same <laughs> song. <laughs> yeah. We got to a point where Goldstein was just kind of looping that, and that's when Alex came in and was like, "How about this?" We're like, "Oh shit!" <laughs> like it's kind of hard to write a melody over a part like that. You know what I mean? But well, there's already so much movement, to... and it's already so catchy. Yeah. It's just like, there's why fight with what this this greatness? I remember having a really hard time. Uh, I had like a brain fart moment where I could not get the melody for the life of me. It was like I was singing like. <laughs> Why do the monsters come out at night? Why do we sleep where we want to hide? And that too high. Oh, hide. too high. Yeah. I could, I could not. I could too not. Too high. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I could not get that note out. Like, and uh, it took I me remember like, that, yeah. Yeah, I had to walk away for a day and we had to come back and record the, the actual vocal for it the next morning because mm-hmm. I could not see it's so that good. fucking note. It's, it's also a, a testament, once again, to the way that we did this record and everyone's kind of flexibility to have Goldstein come in and be like, all right, man, like, here's where we built the studio. Go in the closet, uh, you know, to the B room that we like in a normal studio mm-hmm. setting that just couldn't really happen. And also a testament yeah. to your flexibility and willingness just to be like, okay, <laughs> just yeah. have it happen. Yeah. It's so funny. Cause that, that guitar, I think is, it was just like whatever guitar was lying around. It's like, is that a guitar? It was just the first <laughs> guitar in the room. I was like, all right, I'm plugged yeah. in. And we yeah. Did. And I also, about the song, I really enjoy, like, the way the music and melodies feel along with the lyrics. It, there, there's, like, a very special connection. It has to that feeling of, like, addiction and the things that haunt you that you can't run away from. And it, mm-hmm. like, it kind of captures that atmosphere as well, which I really like. I would sort of wonder if that's why this song was so, like, it came so quickly to all of us, especially once we got to working on the lyrics, is it felt like yeah. we, we sort of all went there. You know what I mean? As we were going yeah. over the lyrics, like, um, I, yeah. I remember, like we, we all were sort of throwing out similar ideas and similar concepts and, and for each line. And um, I just remember it coming together so fast because everybody was able, like very much tuned into the same, same wavelength. And I think a big part of that was because the music spells it out for you. It. It's funny, I, I was originally, I wanted to call the Who Hurt You EP Hangover Hotel which mm. actually yeah. did not fit at all with the who hurt you music and the, in the concept. And it was, it was, but I'd thrown that out there and I, in the session, I threw it out there, like almost kind of half jokingly. And you're like, that's fucking sick. And then you put it in there and I was like, Oh shit. Like, all right. <laughs> yeah. I remember, I remember <laughs> saying it, that was like at the very beginning of when we started trying to write some lyrics and you, you were scrolling through your phone and you just had some, like some really cool one liners and yeah, you threw out hangover hotel. And I was like, that kind of cracked the whole first verse for me because it immediately set the scene. It was like, oh yeah, of course yeah. you're in, you're in this, you're in this another day, another headache in, in the hangover hotel. And like, it totally allowed us all to lock in on where we were and what we were talking about. And um, 
Yeah. What's interesting about this song too, is that there's, there are two versions of this obviously, because a little bit later on, um, we, because of Andrew, thankfully, uh, also working with Black Bear, we got Black Bear to come and feature on this track. And uh, he wrote uh, an entirely different second verse and brought a sick bridge to the table. And um, the, the song actually had a, a completely different verse when we, when we wrote it, like verse two mm -hmm. had a, its own set of lyrics. And um, yeah. I was, Alex, the, the, I was just thinking about this. One thing that the song didn't originally do is the second half of the chorus didn't have that like staccato, like dun, dun, dun. that was, that kind of came in later. Do you remember that gold scene? Oh, kind of right. like almost like the, almost like the U, like I think we like kind of got it from yeah. the used-ish yeah. kind of like, what right. if the second half of the chorus wasn't played out as more staccato, yeah. which is kind of rare for a chorus, you know, I mean, at least for the second half. Also, yeah, like the first, time I, the first time I heard this, yeah, I thought the, it was just so cool how like anthemic and sick the song was, but how like, strange like the beats were like for like mm -hmm. the second the second half of the chorus doing that and the way that you guys had the chorus not start on the one like with the music was like yeah but 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 it does it like every time like that's pretty cool yeah i remember we kind of kept deliberating over whether or not that that break before the chorus hit was going to be just a last chorus moment and we went the again we went the other way with it uh, in, in keeping with breaking tradition of what you're supposed to do <laughs> writing a song. And for some reason, like all these little happy accidents worked. Yeah, especially with like, Jack, what you're talking about with the stab, dun, dun. that part, I would think, I think we were talking about it, like that part usually comes first. Like maybe that comes first and then it's like more open. And when it wasn't that way is when it was effect, when it like made us all really excited at least. Yeah, cause yeah. it's different and it's new and like, yeah, we, we flipped it. The song, the course opens up and then kind of closes, which is super rare. Yeah, and I know like play, playing the song for Black Bear when, when we were first talking about getting him on it, that part is what he liked and he also really loved and related to the lyrics a lot. Um, and I think that's what drew him to the song as well. Not to mention, I mean, his verse is just so, the, yeah, like so the place good. that it takes this song, it, I remember hearing it back the first time he cut his vocals for it and we, we heard it. It was like, oh, oh, there you are, Peter. It's like we, ha <laughs> we, we, we already had something we already had something special, are. but then like he lended his voice to it and his like added some original concept and lyrics to it. And it was just like, whoa, we got, we got a good one here, boys. <laughs> it, was, it was that and moment for sure. What's even weirder is how quickly the Borat remix came. <laughs> <laughs> Literally oh, yeah. the second day we were working on the song, the Borat remix was invented. Oh yeah. And it's, uh, I mean, arguably the better version, the superior <laughs> version of the song. <laughs> I remember it was so seriously presented, like, hey, we got a new mix. Take a listen, take your time with it, but listen to it. Yeah. So one, the one thing I was trying to do um, that wasn't executed because I talked to your manager, Nano, and I was like, when it was getting mixed, I contacted Neil Avron and I was like, hey, man, can you send this version to everyone and say, hey, guys, I tweaked the mix. Can you check this one out? <laughs> And Nano said that's not how the chain of command worked and who was like receiving the songs. Damn it. But Ooh. Nano was able to forward it at least to everybody. <laughs> it was so that's good. Funny. <laughs> yeah. For everyone who doesn't know, uh, there's a version of this song that just the chorus wraps up with instead of fuck up my life, it, it's just my wife. And uh, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's beautiful. It's beautiful and moving. This one's just a special one to me. I remember like Andrew and I, like later on after we finish it because Andrew and I write songs you know pretty much every day with different people and something like this where it happens so organically and natural and it's special I remember Andrew and I just like later on that night like what the fuck just happened like and we were kind of just like do they even know like how big this song is like, this, this you said it song. you said it to me numerous times that trip you're like I don't think you realize how good the song is I'm like yeah it's a song it's going on the record for sure dude <laughs> <laughs> like, calm, calm down, like, Kev. Calm the down. Writer, the song's yeah, going. Down. It's the, yeah, the writer just trying to get his cut. Like, dude, this yeah. one's yeah. really. <laughs> so, like, Servini, from a production standpoint, what does, if not the, it's it's not heavy distorted guitars. What gives the weight to the chorus in this the synthy, like fuzzy bass? Um, my yes, my rock. Is it just my rock and drums? <laughs> <laughs> well, I rem I remember like you guys had like like you guys had kind of made a demo and like wrote the song and then you brought it to me and like it sounded really dope and I was like I didn't know exactly where we should take it so we started like putting in or I started trying to put in a bunch of like distorted guitars in the chorus and stuff and 
it just like was not the vibe. Um, mm -hmm. And so we just, so we, yeah, we actually wound up leaning on like a more distorted synth bass that kind of fills up the same space as um, the distorted guitar. But yeah, we have this. Yeah, because that's kind of doing what a distorted guitar would do, but in a slightly darker and different yes. way, I think. It's, it fills and, up that same sonic space, though. Yeah, that combined with Andrew's guitar. Yeah. It just, it's like rhythm and lead guitar, but in a different yeah. way, um, which is kind of cool. Can we actually listen to that soloed out section one more time with, with the clean guitars and that sub bass, bass sub bass, <laughs> and, the, and the, also the uh, electric bass, please? Yes. <laughs> Like nothing, nothing Bring in the drum. there is Bring that the drums. is that big, but somehow the chorus just feels huge. You also have yeah. such an, a fucking aggressive vocal take. Yeah, in a good way. Also true. No. Wait, also let's, true. let's hear the stabs. Is there is there electric? I don't think there's there's heavy guitars in the stabbing party. Uh, there's, there? a, there's a little, a little bit. There's like bit of a heavier guitar. Um. Yeah, you get a little bit of that payoff there. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, you bring in a couple more things. Yeah, honestly, it's, yeah, and you're right. The the vocal um, drives it along quite a bit as well. Do all the monsters come out at night? Why do we sleep when we want to? Yeah, all those things just kind of add it up, just kind of yeah. make it. Um, they stack really nicely, even though none of them are all are, are that big. One of the things that I love about this song is we have a we have a Dirty Laundry reference in the song, strung out like laundry on every line which references our last album. And um, something I love about that is I think the, the approach sonically to this song is a little bit more in line with some of the production on, on Last Young Renegade. Uh, yep, and, sure. You know, like using those big, dirty synths uh, instead of a wall of guitars to create that sort of atmospheric, like big sound. Um, so it's kind of cool how there's a lyrical play and a sonic nod to yeah, our last for sure. Also, very cool use of vocoder in this song, which I always yeah. love. Yeah. Mm. That's a nice layer. Yeah. I need. I need sick. before we go. Before we depart from this song, I need the uh, the gang vocal, the "fuck up my life" at the end of the chorus, because I uh, can, yeah. I can only everyone did it, but I can only hear Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> I just hear Kevin. <laughs> that's Kevin. <laughs> and also who in like in 2020 would have thought that uh a song with a big gang vocal at the end of the chorus would be like getting played on the radio and shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kind of yeah. Of and a hooky like and a hooky gang vocal. Yeah, that's like a staple from like early 2000s pop punk and like somehow we sort of put that in on this song and it's it it works and doesn't like sour the song or make it feel dated, which is kind of rad. So yeah, that's the song. What a jam. And uh, I mean, yeah, Andrew and Kev, like, shit. Just, just thank doing. you for your, thank you for your time. Magic in a bottle, genie in a bottle. Yeah. Thank you guys. No, uh, no, thank you guys. No, thank you. <laughs> hey guys, just I wanted to take this time to say thank you guys. <laughs> I want to say thank you guys so much. Here we are, track eight. Uh, this one is aptly titled "The Interlude," although as we've learn now many people feel like it's just a full song because let's be honest it is, it is. It is. um it's the interlude because it's the halfway point it's where i imagine that if you were listening on a vinyl you would flip it over and i believe if you are listening on the vinyl that is where you flip it over so it's just the halfway point and it's the uh it it kind of after monsters i feel like monsters kind of takes a darker turn and it's the first darker turn of the record and it's the first big in my mind like scenic change on the record um and so i think Pretty Venom does a really nice job of like easing you into where the rest of the record goes. It's like uh, it's like uh, you get smacked over the head with some darkness with monsters, and that thing just you know bashes your brains in. And then this is like the 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 kind janitor that comes and sweeps your brain matter off the floor. I was Come thinking more like a, a nurse or a doctor patching you up. Janitor. Janitor. Okay. And for this one, we're gonna bring in. Um, Mr. Kevin Crevin, I think is his full name. He goes by Sweet Talker, <laughs> but um, hey, there he is. Ah, there he hey. is. Wow. Wow. Oh. Uh, it's so nice to have you here. This is Kevin, for those of you guys who don't know. He, um, he worked with us on several songs on the last record, Last Young Renegade, 
Um, he and Jack have a wonderful uh, music group together. And um, he's been a very spirited and uh, wonderful collaborator um, on a bunch of our recent music. And um, so we had to have him involved in the process. And when we got out to the desert, it all fell into place. And I believe this song, we had gotten back from the bar maybe no was, yeah the mexican place yeah. and then the bar yeah yeah and it was very late i was ready for bed let's say because it was let's just say 3 a.m hmm, let's just say and you guys started playing this kind of trippy kind of like i don't know just very off color off brand song and i was like come on guys like just shut up this isn't gonna happen it's not gonna make it like you're just drunk <laughs> And then by the Dude, next day, yeah. I wake up and like Servini's playing it back, and I'm like, and it was stuck in my head. And I was what's, like, oh funny, damn it, not yeah. again. <laughs> I, I stuck around for maybe like I stuck around until maybe like two, three a.m. And I was like, all right, I gotta call it, guys. But you guys kept working, and I remember like falling asleep to the song just playing in the living room like really loudly, and remember being like, I don't. To be honest, like at the time, I was like, I don't know how this is gonna fit on the record. It's so yeah. different and so unique. But, you know, once I woke up and like you said, Zach was playing it over the speakers at like 10 a.m., 11 a.m., just cranking it. I was like, this is like a fucking great song. I also <laughs> will say real quick, and I'll shut up, is it has, I think, Alex, your vocal performance, um, especially on like the outro portion on the Say That line is so fucking cool to me. And I remember Thanks. you were in that chair, uh, once again, inebriated, just kind of like holding mic like this and it just <laughs> melting it. And I was like, damn, that's cool. <laughs> Uh, that's when the magic happens. When daddy has yeah. his magic sauce, that's when, it, that's when the good stuff comes out. I think the, the thing that was rad to me was this one just came really, like it felt really natural how the whole song came to be. Like we were back from the bars, it was really late. It was drunk, we were kind of drunk. Yeah. And like, I think Kevin, you picked up the guitar and just started playing this riff. And like, I don't think anyone had any intention at first of recording a song and then we, I think both just kind of had that moment where we like looked at each other and went like, oh, this is good. This is too good to go to bed. Like we can't. Maybe. And what, would really, yeah. And poor Servini was, poor Servini was yeah. just like, damn it. All right. Well, I mean, this was. Opens I, up the session. <laughs> I don't, I mean, I don't like, you know, party too much, but this was a rare night where I had had a few drinks. So mm. hearing this song back in the morning was honestly just as much of a surprise to me. As <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um, it, I, rem I remember when you guys started doing the chorus melody, though, you and Kevin, it was like, it felt to me, I was like, how is this not a song already? Like, it just sounds like a song, you know, it's like one of those type, one of those type things. Well, dude, I'll, ne I'll never, for, like, kind of like in what you're saying right now, I'll never forget it. You're just throwing around lyrics and Kevin was like, you and Kevin just throwing lyrics around and then Alex, you threw out uh, fucking with my head will make my heart attack. And I remember being like, that might be my favorite lyric you've Ever yeah. heard it. And I was like, holy yeah. shit, that's so sick. It was like 2 a.m. I was like fucking hammered, but I was like, I love that. I love that part. Kev, was this was this acoustic, <laughs> uh, this this acoustic part mulling around in your brain for a while, or is it just kind of like a a margarita surprise? Margarita surprise. What can I yeah. say? <laughs> They're the best kinds of surprises. Yeah, I uh, I, I really want to listen to that loop if we can. The this entire album was recorded with one mic, actually. Aside one mic, from the one Got to see those that plug-in chain though, because it's a big part of what makes it special. I was gonna say I want to hear it without it at the end, but not now. Yeah, totally. And it just sounds automatically like so melancholy and yeah. like weird and kind of dark and strange. Yeah, it sounds sounds like it's playing off an actual record almost. Well, you, yeah. you know what's interesting is Kevin, you you don't play with a pick, right? You never played with a pick. These things. Yeah, Kevin. Kevin's a Kevin's a finger finger, a finger guitar player. You can these things. You can really you can really hear it in that part. Yeah, yeah. I remember then Alex came up with this lead part here. Oh yeah. I mean that's just tequila. And and we yeah we threw a little like crazy plugins on it. Let's take a look. Mmm. Spooky. So yeah, that gives it that kind of crazy sound. Oh. Can, can wow, we hear the two together? And they just kind of play off each other really nicely. I remember sitting there, we, Kevin and I both had guitars and we were just, because of the inebriation, I think we probably just played this to each other for maybe an hour and then actually started writing this song. <laughs> just, it was one of those moments where we were like nodding at each other. Like, you yeah. thought it was on loop, but you realize you're just still playing it. <laughs> Us, yeah. And I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna get weird for a second here, but the the thing that got me really excited about that part and and as a result this song was uh, it really reminded me of 
one of my favorite Pink Floyd songs. The beginning, it's like the intro of, I think it's Wish You Were Here. And um, it kind of does a similar thing where it sounds like they're listening to a song on the radio and then yeah. that becomes the song. It's almost like you get, you, you go inside the radio and suddenly it's the first yeah. person look at the song that's being played on the radio. And uh, I remember just feeling like, Oh, this is this is something we've never done before. I was really excited by the fact that it was unusual for All Time Low. And if y'all know All Time Low, we always have a couple of weirdos on every album. And it's very important for us. It's always part of our process and part of how we structure our records. There's always a couple songs that just try to go somewhere very different and some somewhere else. And uh, you know, I think I think this was one of those songs for us. And the second I I Kevin and I started working on this one and and it developed into some more thought out pieces. I, uh, I remember feeling like, all right, we got that piece of the puzzle. And that's always really crucial once you're sort of in like deeper into the record processes, you need to like fill those spaces. And, I was and like, so, right, sometimes that can, you know, that can go not the wrong way, but sometimes it becomes like a skipper. And right. on this record so far, like I've seen so many people talk about this song and how much it's like, you know, they connect with it. So it, it went the right way this time. Yeah. And that's the biggest thing. It's like, you want to chase those, those weirdo songs, quote unquote, but like not at the expense of replacing a, just a straight up good song, just to have, just for the sake of having a weird or a different song on there. So this is like, it's very important that this one holds up like it's just a yep. damn good song but it's also all time low doing something a little bit different for us which i think uh krevin is very good at bringing to the table for us every time we've worked together on anything we've we've written some of my favorite all time low songs in recent memory you know we worked on life of the party together on the last record mm. which i i would say is probably my favorite yes that, me too on that yeah. album so um yeah it's it's it's, it's good shit it's good it's shit Maraki. yeah there, there's another hidden thing in this song too so there was like this pool in the house that we were staying in that was like the best pool yes. ever and i think like i was like sitting out with jack one time and i just like voice memoed the pool what? and that's this that's this right here Dude, I don't think I even knew this. I didn't know this. But yeah, but it's it's yeah. just like a layer of noise that goes throughout the whole the entire song pretty much. And I think if I like yeah, if I like extend this file out, you can like hear like us talking to each other and stuff. But yeah, we just like put that in the song. Oh, so let's like, take a listen. Like a layer at, of noise. At the risk of, of yeah. <laughs> hearing something we don't want to hear. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> play again? Ambient noises around the house so that I can uh, put them in the track really get the marble vibe going you know yes <laughs> oh my god so <laughs> but yeah you know, what's, that, uh... you know what's really weird about that uh is alex when when you guys were writing this song i threw out the concept of desert pools and that was the yeah. that was the kind of the yeah. name we had for the song for a second desert pools and that like kind of that like imagery there so that's kind of yeah. weird that you sampled the pool in there <laughs> yeah i'd like to hear alex's vocal in the chorus mm -hmm. because it makes me happy to listen to and then i have a question about the pre-chorus you mean the, the, hot, the, the last one? chorus, the angry, the angry one? I don't care. I just like your, I don't know. You felt it. Yeah. How you gonna say that? That, uh. with my head will make my heart upset. Can it so bad? Feeling this sad. Running around in circles down a wall. Yeah, it sounds amazing. So sick. That's, that's all just the echo from the mansion too. There's no, there's yeah, no reverb yeah, yeah, plug in. Yeah, you can, there's no <laughs> reverb on here. The other thing I remember with this one is that uh, Kevin came to the table with the like, do know what you do, that little melodic run. Yes. And it's like, it is the most earwormy little thing that I've ever heard. Like that, whenever I, if I hear this song one time, that loop is stuck in my head for the rest of the day. Yeah, man, this was a fun one. And I, I, I just think like what was, what's so good about it is it, it really blends, um, you know, what I think we do well in our more acoustic-y chill songs with something new, something that we've really never done before. And I think Kevin and, and Zach Servini were a, a big part of creating that, helping that sort of come to life. A big shout out to Zach for pushing through that night. Cause yeah. I don't, <laughs> we did everything that night. Yeah. We yeah, it was the song. The song was, the song was done. You're right. Yeah. And I it was think, done. I, I genuinely, I'll say this. Like, I think this is one of those songs too that if we had stopped halfway, if we had like put it to bed for the night and come back to it the next day, it probably wouldn't have ever gotten finished, and it no. probably wouldn't no. have made the record and been like such an important part of the album. So it's crazy that those moments are like that 
they're very make or break and they're very spontaneous. And it's just wild when you kind of have one of those work out. Well, me, Zach, and Ryan gave up on the song in the wee hours of the night. You guys, kept, <laughs> you guys kept on. I didn't. Hey, I didn't. I didn't give up on it because I had to play on it. Yeah. yeah. Zach, Zach hung in there. Zach hung in. I just. It was, How dare it was you? More of a, it was more of a. I blacked. I think I blacked out. Oh, I <laughs> you did. You certainly did. So that now brings us to favorite place. It wakes you up after a nice little sleepy tune. Yeah, it's a mm. nice little kickback into into the back half of the record. I think uh, after pretty venom um i've always loved i love a song that starts with drums you know it's just uh it lends itself well to the live setting because you can just drag that out for a fucking hour and a half i can do something and you know we will and i'm just talking yep. to the crowd i'm just like wow well, you guys feel about politics uh, and, and, I'm and then alex my, i'm i'm spinning my mouth <laughs> Alex waves his hand. Ru- Alex waves his hand, and if Ryan misses the cue, he gets fucking Doc Pay off his oh, yeah. next paycheck. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Prince. Oh. Yeah, Doc oh, yeah. Pay. I have very specific <laughs> hand movements that I do to cue everyone, and if they don't, if they don't key into that, as if I would it. ever, ever fucking catch them. <laughs> Jack, fucking, I'm doing the thing. Um, right. Favorite place was a, a Nashville start, I believe. Yes. With mm-hmm. Mr. Pill Gosnell. Let's bring Phil Gornell back in here, huh? Pillow. There he is. There he is. All right, cool. So this was the dream team for this song. We just we started with that drum part, and then uh, we put we bust out the delay on the guitar. Oh and yeah. That was kind of the first part of this song that we wrote. It was the intro, and it just mm-hmm. we were cruising on that for a while. We had it looping, and um, I think diving into that might be a fun little four. I always like to strip away the yes. delay from guitars just to see how silly it sounds. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do yeah. that. Let's, <laughs> Let's go. Bam, 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 bam. <laughs> Oh, geez. So there's yeah, like this big wall of like, break down of like that lead strummed part. out uh, rhythm guitars that are really nice, but then there's also that cool delayed lead. And we don't really, we haven't done a lot of that uh, in all time mm-hmm. though. We don't, I, I haven't done a lot of those, you know, dotted quarter note delay or dotted half note delay. Yeah. Riffy dotted eighth. Dotted eighth. Dotted eighth, dotted eighth okay. sorry. Oh. Things that you may hear <laughs> bands like <laughs> Angels and Airwaves do or Nitro Summer. Def Havana. You know, the I think you too is the one you're all missing here. Yeah, you the too. edge. <laughs> look at that, look, the, the educator, this preset. Yeah. Right I think Def Havana did it first, though. <laughs> the preset's mm-hmm. called the educator. Oh my God. Yeah. I love it. That's so sick. Much. Incredible. Right, that's pretty dope. So, can we, can we listen to it with everything on real quick just to hear what it sounds yeah, like? Yeah, so let's keep this riff. No one. Oh, yeah. Let's hear it without. Let's take that off. Oh, Still it's on. printed. Oh. Uh, <laughs> oh. We explain what that means for everyone watching and listening. It means no, you're sending it. Though. Hard work. The, I think uh, we tracked it through. We tracked it through delay pedals to get it. So it's kind of like the riff was written around that kind of give back that the delay gave you. Like we just, we I remember we started with just the snare lead in, and it's really tough to kind of write something around just a snare on the one. Yeah. So, like, the, the way that we filled the space was with that delay. So I feel like you played into the delay to kind of give oh, you a... Oh, yeah. It was yeah. part of the I writing, not printed. just... Like, that's, that's one of my parts because it's labeled terribly. That's how I recognize it. <laughs> <laughs> dot commit dot duplicate 12. Dot... <laughs> so there's no... Yeah, there's no, no. Re- oh. What we're saying is there's no removing that delay because it wasn't... We, we, uh, you we could try went... singing it, though. It would probably sound something like... Catchy. Yeah. Um, so anyway, it's a really cool textural uh, riff, and um, I think what I like the most about it is it creates sort of this like swimmy energy when you combine that against like the very aggressive, you know, ones on the snare. It kind of it balances out really well. And, it's also uh, we don't do a ton of like what we were calling in the studio Springsteens or like diamonds, which are just like big held out chords, like whole yeah. note chords. Yeah. Um, and the movement comes from that kind of, you know, mm-hmm. train just moving along drum beat and then that spastic guitar part. So with like, if you had a ton of strumming along with that, it would just get so jumbled and confused. A lot of information. Yeah. It's another one to me that really feels like where we wrote it. Yep. You know, yeah. the, everything kind of about it, it screams, to me anyway, it kind of screams Nashville. It's got that whole yeah. big rock and roll openness feel to it. It's I very agree. True. There's some Americana to this one for mm. sure. I think it, it uh, lends itself to what we were all sort of vibing uh, in the setting. What's um, this arpeggio that you got here? 
Yeah, I, I like working on stuff with Phil because there's always like he always has really cool synths that just that he layers in and it gives this song kind of a big just extra layer of sheen. So if you solo this stuff out, it sounds like that. And see what's cool tell, about those that's layers. Yeah, that's Phil and Swank. Like in there. Yeah. What's cool about those layers is that one is doing sort of almost a stabby thing that that imitates the guitar, the picked guitar, mm -hmm. and then there's another thing that's actually kind of doing like a a four on the floor, like matching the snare, which is um, yeah. That it kind of it gives the guitar the guitar becomes percussive. Yeah. You know what I mean? More, more than just the notes, it's it's giving it that kind of punch. It helps you. Not can, can you play the Can you uh, can you solo out the guitars with that part? Yeah. Color, you know? And there's the little, um, the little, the little, like, brung, brung, brung. that's like really helping you, like, drive the. Yeah, they're changing part. with the chords to kind of give that. It sounds like the lead part is moving with that root as well. Exactly. Mm -hmm. For the rhythm section and the verses yeah. where it's just kind of uh, kick drum and bass are just locked in yeah. pretty much every hit. Like, every time I hit the kick, there's a bass uh -huh. note along with it, which. Yeah. It's not something we do terribly often, honestly. Like a lot of times no, the bass is driving through on like eighth notes or just driving through and the drums are doing something separate. But this one, it's like every hit, a, a bass, a guitar. Yeah, there's fun. actually a lot that's pretty unique about this song too, because one, it goes a lot of different places pretty quickly. Like the, the intro and re-intro is sort of this double time feel. And then the verse quickly shifts gears to a much more chill feel. And then when that chorus hits, it's another new feel. It's it's a, like a, yeah. sort of a pickup snare. backwards beat kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, backbeat. Um, and a lot of the time that can sort of start to feel really disjointed. And I remember when we were making this song, we fought a lot with that chorus beat. Um, yes, because it we knew that's what we wanted to do, but because of all the changes, it was very hard to not have the song feel hiccupy and like you were getting pulled this way right. and this way. And I this remember way. originally. You know, not that this is probably getting too like technical, but originally, you know, it starts with the button and the chorus does with the yep. snare on the one. And originally I wanted that to just be kick and crash. And you thought that felt too like confusing to the listener. Um, but that was one thing you and I kind of went back and forth on. And in the end, it, it's much better to have it the way it is. But I was just so stuck on that. Maybe, idea. maybe play that. Maybe play that part. Yeah. So it starts right away with snare. So it's like. Of course. And those fills, the fills into the chorus were really important here because it kind of, you had to do something in advance. Can we just hear that one more time mm -hmm. coming out of the verse? And maybe with a little bit of the music, just so we can get a sense for where we are in the song. But like one of the things we really locked in on from the demo to when you were recording drums was making sure that your fills going into the chorus started getting you to that down yeah. on the one of the snare. Uh, exactly. Because yeah. It, it so it didn't just, feel like it was like out of, out of nowhere. Yeah. And that's how it kept feeling was it's like, oh my God, where did that chorus come from? But mm. it, all it took was a, a quick fill that got you there and led you into it that suddenly really explained the chorus and that information that you were now processing. So, Maybe I was wrong. Maybe I was wrong for this. But you feel like the sun on my face. So can we close this so kind of space between us yeah. now? It's the distance and then. Another thing about this song, uh, well, obviously we haven't even talked about Camino Boys, but um, right. also another unorthodox basic overall style where there's no third chorus. The bridge <laughs> kind of just morphs into an outro and that's it. Um, which, of course, I fought once again. But <laughs> <laughs> Leave him wanting more, baby. Leave him wanting yeah, more. You didn't, you didn't seem to win many battles in this. No. Show, <laughs> no. Most, of my, most of my points were just this isn't how songwriting works. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of like tendency to want to break tendency, I guess on this one, we, we tried to not do things that would be expected on every song, because I think yeah. especially when you're writing rock or pop rock or, or anything, it, it's very easy to just do one thing well. And I think we sort of challenged ourselves at certain moments to, not do that so for example with this song it was it was it would have been easy to go and do a big third chorus moment but it also felt like we had heard that information already a few yeah. times in, enough times and so it was kind of nice to then drop it down and end the song with this really sort of tender um emotional version of the chorus that like almost like i was sitting in a room writing it for the first time kind of thing. And I feel like that was a sensibility that we wanted to capture on this song because it very much- I think that's how we tracked it. I think you played and sang it live. 
I probably, if I'm being we honest. We dropped the it. click and it was just both of yeah. you. It was just you playing and singing. If yeah, I'm not mistaken, is this the one that ends with a like, little piano outro? Yeah, yes. the, pi- the that's yeah. sad piano. That, that, that's Swank just doing. <laughs> just like terrified. <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, yeah, that's me good po- enough. Me pointing at him going, now. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> What's funny is that when we first got the, like, the masters back for this record, I sent it to him. Right, go, go ahead. Let's, let's just listen to that whole end segment. Okay, yeah. I, think, yeah. I think that whole down chorus into that is really cool. Cause I'm not too far and you're my favorite place. That is nice. And the piano treatment like it's in another room and it's kind of yeah. detuned and love it. Mm. The detuning nice. at the end is my favorite thing, how it just gets all wobbly and weird. Yeah. And so that's the Valhalla verb kind of making it sound like it's next door and uh what's what's doing the detuning is that the you got a uh, preset sad piano <laughs> 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 you gotta love. and it is yeah and it's this wobble knob makes it, it it acts like an old tape machine and it it adds some pitch fluctuation i'll tell can you, you what. can you sh- can you strip the verb in the rc20 just to hear what yes. it sounds like just to yes. see like a producer's mind yes. for a listener to like this so is what it go. starts with it certainly is a sad piano Yeah. Not yeah, as cool with everything. Some, some tremolation, though. Yeah. Wobble there. I'm so sad. Yeah. More it's like a, it's more like ethereal. Sad, more it's like a sad, sad. Haunt, haunted house. You can house. see the wobble yeah. working. There's <laughs> yeah. also some incredible bass work on this song. Uh, between drums and bass, the yeah, rhythm section fun. crushes in this. Do we want to check that out a little bit? Zach, do, uh, yeah, do I mean, yeah there's, a, um, there's a lot of, like what Ryan was saying earlier, like, Space is like your best friend, especially in the rhythm section, because it allows for the vocals to breathe. But when you can lock in really well with drums and give uh, vocals that space, it just creates such a bigger atmosphere for the song and the listener as well. So, yeah, and like, on a drum perspective, nice. like we can listen to the verses, I think would be cool where they go. Um, you know, if we go halfway through it, it goes from half time to full time. Um, and there still is like a t- like his accent, mm-hmm. like a ton of space to let guitars and melody do their thing. And as a drummer, I can kind of keep a groove going with what we call ghost notes, which is the left hand basically just like tapping, like not hitting as hard at all. So if you listen to drums and bass, you'll hear like a little in between each hit. And those are called ghost notes. Not that anyone gives a shit, but. No, I actually, I'll tell <laughs> my you My cousin would, I'll, I'll my cousin now. <laughs> I'll tell you something about this one. Um, yeah. Those, those notes in this verse were really important. And I remember... Yeah one iteration you you played it cleanly yes and i I didn't realize that you had stopped and i had like gone out of the room for a minute and i remember coming back in as you were tracking drums and you were just doing like a clean playthrough of it and i was like why does this song suck all of a sudden (laughs) like it was that it was that dramatic of a of a like realization and i didn't know what it was at the time but it like that groove is so vital yeah like for making the verse feel that interesting because it's that constant little backbeat that shuffle from the we take a listen, Savini. Bass and drums. Yeah, sure. Maybe vocal if you want it. And I just, I couldn't, I hated it. I hated the song. <laughs> yeah. Don't you anyone know you can't be tame, love? Maybe I was wrong. Maybe I was wrong for this. But you feel so like sick. the sun. And the bass is kind of like classic so feeling. It's, it's almost like temptations. Like, <laughs> yeah, it feels a little bit like 60s, 70s right there, which is kind of cool. Yeah. And then obviously, Ben Camino, geez. Um, so we had this song finished, buttoned up, done. We sent it their way. And uh, fortunately, they were actually in the studio at the time. I don't remember what they were working on, but um, they were able to lend their vocals to this song. And I thought, again, what's interesting about the way we constructed this song and the way it ended up happening with the feature is that because we have those two big choruses, it allowed us to do like, okay, verse one and chorus one, me, verse two, chorus two, let's lean into Ben Camino. And so I think you get a really cool dynamic there of like, it's almost like two bands performing this song together, which I feel like in a lot of features, it doesn't come across like that. So mm. um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting maybe, collaboration. Maybe Servini can speak to this. Um, when we initially got the feature sent back to us, I think they were just really kind of in the second verse and 
I feel like a, a lot of us felt like we kind of wanted to, like you said, make it more like a collaboration where like your voice is coming in and theirs is coming out. And yeah. Like, but, and like kind of in the second chorus for you be able to hear everyone's voice together, which is yeah, tough. Alex, you know? Alex touched on that for sure. Where like, you know, the third chorus is kind of just all of you guys because they have two singers and you're on it too. It's, it's a nice little, but it just works together. Yeah, chorus two, chorus two. Chorus two, yeah. Two, yeah sorry. It's like... um very much an amalgamation of, of everyone at that point. And I think we have all three of us actually singing uh, the lead, if not maybe one, one of them is doing a harmony, but um, it's pretty cool. And it like, it, it just adds to the song. It, it, uh, it definitely beat the original version of me doing it twice. And um, obviously what's, what's nice, <laughs> what's nice is I think it's cool to get like that big group chorus and then it immediately goes into the instrumental break and then when it finally does come back out it, it settles into that last very intimate chorus back to yep. the singing again it happened very naturally you know we didn't have to like overthink where to place them or what the arrangement should be it was should just we listen to chorus three vocals yes yeah, it's, it's kind of cool too since since they have two singers so and so they're on 50 percent of the song basically so the first half of the verse is spence and then the second half of the verse is jeff and then when you guys get to the second chorus, it's all of you together, but it's Spence for the first half and then Jeff for oh. the second half. So Same there is that. still there is still kind of a little bit of variation. Um, but but yeah, it is cool that they're on yeah, most of the song. And they have such an interesting dynamic between the two of them as as sort of both being lead singers in Ben Camino. So it's it's very signature to kind of have both of them doing what they do so well on this yep. song. Mm -hmm. feel just as much Camino as it does all time low. It's pretty cool. So can we close the space between us now? It's the distance we don't need. Yeah, you're everything I love about the things I hate in me. So come on, come on, come over now Damn. and fix me That's with one of my your favorite. grace. Oh, Cause I'm not too far and you're my favorite place. Very sick. So oh, I, love, that's I actually great. really love the way that the highs and the low harmonies in this song play off each other. It's very yeah. brutal. And I really love particularly that second half when uh, the low, so come on, come, come on, on yeah. come over now. And, and what that does for the whole stack, like if we can just go back to that moment with a little bit of pre-roll, it's really mm. cool how it creates that second half lift without doing too much. Things I hate in me. Right so come on, come on, come over now and Man, fix me so with your grace. He's a nice, a tasty harmony. Mm -hmm. I, I also really like this ambient filter vocal thing. It's pretty cool. Let's check that out. What's happening there? I don't even know if I know what that is. Hey! Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, it sounds like the Marble Mansion. Our, man. <laughs> our good That's all natural, Chris, baby. Algae. <laughs> CLA baby, those CLA plugins never fail. I like CLA. I am no, I am no producer. I am no engineer. I uh, am pretty terrible in the studio recording myself. But I'll tell you what, if I track a demo and then I throw enough of those CLA plugins on there, <laughs> it sounds pretty fucking. <laughs> yeah, here's that without the without the CLA. Hey! Um, oh, uh, super dry. Yeah, instant arena. It's nice. Yeah, really. It's real nice. That's perfect. Thanks, CLA. He's mixed a bunch of our shit. Not on this album, but he's he's yeah, he's good. Damn man. it, if I do you and many many of our songs. He's real good. Fuck, this is a good Close, song. Yeah. I'm gonna listen to this song after we're done with this, guys. Let's do it. I think we I think we've covered most of yeah. uh, most of this song. Uh, what are we moving on to? What what comes next? We got uh, next is a song called Saf. Huh? Oh man, oh, nice. Safe was a, an interesting one because it took uh, pretty much the whole process to get it right. Mm -hmm. Musically, it was there. I remember it was one of the earlier ideas we had, and it was just this really nice, again, sort of to what Phil said about the last song, kind of had that a little bit of that Americana Nashville thing inherently in it. Um, but then it took me forever to get the lyrics right on this one. And I think it was because this is one that in the process, I sat on the couch and I very much just like ad-libbed vocals for it. And um, I think came up with the, uh, the concept in singing safe and some of the chorus lyrics and things like that. But a lot of it was very placeholder and it was all melody. And I just had a really hard time writing the words and writing words that I love to fit those melodies perfectly. You know what I mean? Cause it was one of those songs where sometimes you can tweak some words here and there syllables and it still works. But with this one, every time I changed anything to get a lyric I liked better in, I then hated the melody. 
So it was a it was a tough one to sort of get right in that sense. And I remember like working on the lyrics all the way up to sort of the last few days in Palm Desert. And I yeah. So For sure. Was, uh, yeah, I was just gonna say that's funny that you say that because this is my favorite song lyrically on the album. Hmm. Uh, yeah, because there's so much yeah, faith. So the lyrics the work, really, work was worth it. <laughs> they're really important because it's kind of such a kind of a a relaxing track. It really kind of puts you in a mindset to listen and kind of feel what you're singing about because of the, the kind of the music behind it. And the, I think there is like maybe four different iterations of the vocals out there because it yeah. just changed every time. And like, I'd, I'd go back and listen to different versions and be like, oh, fuck, I really liked it when this was the lyric, but then it made no sense contextually because they were just placeholders. Right. And that's one thing that you kind of just get stuck on those original placeholders and the way that they made you feel and like, well, but it actually makes a zero sense. It means nothing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, this is by far one of my favorite bridges of the record with the, uh, the vocoder happening underneath your vocal. And it's just a very like, dude, I fucking, if we could yeah. put vocoder in every song, I would. <laughs> <laughs> I think what's really cool about this song is it takes a very uh, kind of easy and not easy, but like a very straightforward, um just cruiser of a song and we added in a lot of really different elements and i would say that this song has a lot of inspiration draws a lot of inspiration sonically from our last record i think yep. like in the vocoder and some of the synths and some of the delays and things that it did uh it took sort of more of a straightforward kind of like a um like a wallflower song or something like that uh and and leveled it up to sort of live in 2020 um, Can we take a listen to that bridge? Maybe, yeah, I think you got the vocal. Yeah, there's, go here. there's so much, like, so many vocal delays and layers and stuff without the song, or throughout the song. Just put the car in track, the So sick. The coastal highs forever under why don't you take a little time to get away what's cool about that is again it's a wide open space in that bridge and so all of that sort of vocal the digitized vocal information like really helps to fill it up without crowding because none yes. of it's really rhythmic i think the, the little backgrounds that you heard at the top are nice in that they create a little bit of movement in what i'm doing but then all of the chordal stuff underneath just makes it feel like, you know, it repla it replaces where you would have these big strummed out guitars and it kind of like yep. balances well, it out in a different way. Do we have, what do we have acoustic wise in the chorus? Is there acoustic guitar like driving in the back? I can't His... remember about like, we listened, me and JB listened back to the demos of this one. And I don't, I don't think um, there was an acoustic. I, I think like it switched from being a bit more kind of downbeat and kind of straight. Yeah, so whale. there are acoustics in the Caroos. Oh yeah, there's whales. That's a, that's what is the whale? Name. What is the whale track? It goes. Is that true? Yeah, it will be something like that. We actually recorded real whales for this one. <laughs> ah. Oh. Ah. <laughs> okay. There he is. <laughs> can we hear? Can we hear it with context in the song? <laughs> it's gotta be just in the bridge. I'll turn it up a little bit. <laughs> it's, nice. it's, like really, it's a cool little setup though it's a whale going like this just coming you know by really, Dude, you know what i really I love... like about this song is that things like that this song was very much uh it's literally about driving and a moment like that even though it's not it's not the sound of a car passing you on the highway hitting its horn but it's very reminiscent of something that might sound like that in a much more musical way. And so I yep. think there's, there's all these little Easter eggs in this song of like the uh, scene setting sounds that kind of trick your mind into going like, wait, what dude, I, I love the guitar tone in the bridge. Mm. I'll be stealing that live. Valhalla all over that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Shimmer. Shimmer. Can we take those off for a second? I want to see if I can figure out which guitar this was. I'm thinking it was that Duo Sonic. It's like nice, nice and thin. That's pretty. Do we have a hollow body, a semi holly touch? Yeah, we had I, the natural. Yeah. It's that thing. That one. Um, yeah. One other thing, real quick, on just to bring back to me because 
most people are watching this want to know about my drums. Um, <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> there was one thing I do in this chorus that, A, I just love. I love a, a quick closed hi-hat, open to closed hi-hat, and all my fills, I do it a lot. And I've always wanted to have it in a chorus like this. Um, and I've never really been able to sneak it in as part of the actual beat. I've always done it as a fill. And when Phil and I were doing the drums for like the, before the song was really written, we were just like kind of getting together a drum bed. I was able to program it. And then as we got along further and further, it kind of worked as part of the rhythm in the song. So I was very happy to be able to, it's not like a difficult thing at all, but it's just rhythmically and sonically, it's a cool little. Pssst, pssst, you hear it every time you nod to it. Every yeah. Time. yeah. Well, it made the verse that much hookier. It's just another hook in this song. I'm talking about the chorus. Yeah. <laughs> can you point out which part specifically you're talking about yeah. i actually thought that there's a groove that you do similar to that in the verse but there is it is yeah, in the verse is. too oh well there you go there. <laughs> ah, that yeah and then this time tom and then back to i've never noticed that right yeah, yeah. bass follows it on every yeah, other bass hits it too yep Bring in the bass for the back half, and then we'll... And then tambourine's the second half of the chorus is key, too. Ooh, big pickup. Big pickup. I've never my noticed that hi-hat. My heart's going right now. <laughs> <laughs> he loves it. Yeah. Put just through on that one. It's usually the first... Okay, right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so off. <laughs> uh, there's actually some cool things here with bass where I typically would follow the regular melody, but in this song, I actually follow the counter melody for most of my fills, which is not a typical thing to do, but oh, cool. it doesn't take away from the actual lyrics. It just kind of makes it like a moment that passes by, like kind of like in the lyric where we're driving, but it's on its own, like to the right or to the left rather than right in your face. It's traffic going the other direction. Yes, like both that. Ways. And I love the message of this song too. I think I was really trying to hone in on almost like an answer to the song Runaways from Future Hearts uh, and kind of telling another side of that story um, where it felt like, you know, if Runaways was sort of like the precursor, that this was kind of the doing, the acting on that right. emotion and like finding your, finding your safe zone by getting away from the things that stress you out. And um, I... I certainly know that that's been something that's helped me in the past. Like just, I, I love, I feel like I can reset my brain just by taking a drive. That's something that yep. um, when I'm, when we're in the creative space, I'll often get in the car and just drive for an hour and listen to what we're working on. And that becomes very therapeutic for me and like giving some perspective of where I think uh, things are going, but also just in life. I think that's, uh, that's something that's always helped me sort of like clear my head. Um, and I like, it was fun to kind of explore that in, the context of this song and how you know the world is very volatile and it's hard to find those moments in those places in a, in a fast moving life um where you feel kind of safe and uh that for me is my car yeah the line where you say you're gonna be all right if you just stop thinking it over that like really that might be like my favorite line on the album that really hits home and i think that for a lot of people because we just think a lot overthink things and you know try too hard but it's like sometimes you just got to take a break and let it be what it is and let it let it do its thing oh so. yeah i really i like that lyric because of the double play on the meaning like the fact that it's if you just stop thinking it over in the sense of like stop mulling on it stop waiting to commit mm -hmm. to, to this thing that you're considering but i also like if you flip it stop thinking it over being overthinking um and then, you know, the idea that, like you said, I think we put a lot of pressure on ourselves sometimes to make the right decision. And sometimes that pressure causes us to, you know, not just go with our gut, what our gut's telling us. And a lot of the time I find that um, what my gut is saying to me is usually the best answer for me. I also really love, I think one of my favorite things about this song in general was that this was almost a finished song that Phil produced um, before Zach even got there. We had like the bulk of this song done save the lyrics um that i had a lot of placeholders for but uh it was really cool to see its evolution from the version that we came up with originally uh to where like zach took it once we had some other songs to work around and how we sort of like brought this one into the fold into the um, same universe yeah exactly and i think i think there's just a really nice sensibility again with having <clears throat> several people 
working on this album who are all producers uh, and being able to kind of play nice together in that way. It's you know, insane you, that it worked. I wouldn't think that it would all work out because everybody has their own methods. And I just think we got so like incredibly lucky to be surrounded by the kind of talent that like Phil and Zach and Andrew and Colin have to be able to take each other's work and take each other's, you know, strengths and like build on those rather than having to dismantle and start and, over. It was very And cool. without any sort of hesitation, like I'm just speaking your guys' praises while you're right here, but like all it <laughs> takes, I know for me and I'm sure for anyone, like it's just a split second of, a, like a look or something like if Phil said, Hey Zach, why don't you try this? Or Zach yeah. was like, Hey Phil, I'm going to strip this plug in. I didn't really like it. All it takes is one little look or one little moment of like, don't do that. Like that's mine. And then the whole thing, that whole trust system kind of crumbles. Yeah. And that just yeah. never happened between all of the people that worked in this record and all the band members. Like we've talked about before. It was just, it was just so open and stupid ideas weren't, it didn't exist. Like it, it just, anything was so free to be said and you would never be made to feel like an idiot. Yeah, if the songs would have sucked, it would have been different. But <laughs> it was it was an honor, you know. Like the song, the songs were good, and everyone that was working on everything had something original and exciting to bring to it. So you know, I was excited to let Zach kind of take the reins and bring it into the universe that you guys built for it, because you know he just has this kind of ability to bring the life to it that you know different minds don't think of yeah it's kind of it's kind of like when you're watching a movie and all the nations are working together to stop an alien invasion and like you know you got russia and the united states working together for once and they're shaking hands and then they're back, you know what I mean? it's like that it's like a, it's like a, it's like a bigger version of that yeah I, I was just happy to be there but i i think it is it yeah it is it is cool um that we were able to kind of combine all of our strengths and kind of can piece them all together to make yes um yeah to make the best product possible um and that's what makes this record so multi-dimensional and so cool i think let's I listen think, to the safes and the verses because i really like that the vocals yeah stuff. yeah you know you took a lyric and and a melody and you turned it in like, almost like <laughs> kind of like a rhythm in a way like it's like it's like was it, really a, it was also one of those things that one of the few things in this record that took like six takes i remember you just sitting oh. on the couch and be like no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here we go. To be honest, I think there's actually, I think there's still one in there that doesn't even say safe that it might have been from when we were. Yeah, it might just be me going like, ah. or are they all safe? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, there that's it is. Well, that's days because it's echoing the lyrics. But. Oh, okay. Um. Ooh, hey. That's the one I love the most because it like adds this new rhythmic thing. So can we listen to that in the context of like maybe just the, the vocals sold yep. out with that answering? Safe, better keep that thought to yourself. When you find that place and it only lasts for a minute. Yeah, it only lasts for a minute. These days, gotta take your time, find your space. And then this is kind of cool yeah. in, the second, in the second verse here. We, you're, we start out with your vocal. Not to get too nerdy here, but I think what's also really fun about the note that those are hitting is that I think it's making the triad. Because um, you never actually hear that, that note in uh, the melody of the verse. But if you think about it in the context of what the notes are doing, you're going, safe, safe. And then the note in between, it, dum, dum, dum. So you're, all, you're sort of always getting that triad which is just a really pleasant thing to hear. What were you saying about the second verse there, Savini? Or um, the way we started out, what is this effect on this vocal here? Oh, yeah. You can keep that thought for oh, yeah, it's just like a little filter action. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Oh, yeah. Kind of, cool. kind of uh, it's sort of- It like opens up into it. Moment. It's cool, because it, I, I wouldn't have thought to do that, and you added it in, and I honestly, at first, like thought it was not meant to be on there. And then- um, I realized how, like, what it was doing in the sense that it was almost like you're kind of, um, <laughs> if you were a DJ and you kind yeah, of opening it up. <laughs> sort of like yeah. suck everything out for a second and bring it back, it like gets yeah, you yeah. that second verse nicely. Yeah, I once, I once had a successful producer say to me, the most important part of a song is the way you transition into the second verse. Hmm. And wow. that made me think because it's like, that is what keeps you listening to the yeah. rest of the song. Because if you hit the second verse, yeah, you're going to get the rest of the song. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
Can we listen to chorus, vocals, and guitar, and keys, just without bass and drums, just without the weight of it? I just want to hear. Yeah, there's uh, acoustic. Two things. I love the high organ in the back there. And then also I like the juxtaposition of this, like I said, this pleasant chorus and this nice, like easy melody with the aggression of your vocal. You, at the very beginning of talking about this song, you sort of, uh, you mentioned that we kind of referenced Jimmy Eat World on this one a little bit. And I would say one of the biggest things where I personally referenced Jimmy Eat World on this was not necessarily like the music or the sound, but it was like the urgency with which Jim Atkins like sings his songs. Yes. And like, you can like hear him shaking in the booth. Yeah. There's always something very like honest and emotional and raw about the way that he uh, performs and sings, especially on, uh, on recordings, because I've always felt like when I look back at our older work, I can very much see like how I was not as seasoned and I was much more green. And I see that in like, not, and this isn't trying to like make myself sound better. Like what I'm saying, I think I always had good pitch and I could always carry a tune but I was not always the best at like getting the emotion right. in, the, in the song. So sometimes I feel like when we would make a record and I listen back to our old music, I'm like, that's just me singing the song. But like yeah. Yeah, this on this record and on this song in particular, I was really trying to like, not just nail it pitch wise. I was trying to really get like some of that emotion and that feeling in there. And yeah. And that's just got to come from comfort in the studio. You know, mm-hmm. we've talked about it before how intimidating a studio setting can be because it's just, everyone is waiting for you to mess up. Like everyone's yeah. just staring at you. The only one thing people can hear. And until you're comfortable in that setting and you're okay with messing up, I can imagine all you're thinking about is your pitch, your melody, your timing. Just you're not get it letting, right. Just get it yeah. right. Just get it's it right. the same like with me playing drums live. Like the first time you play any of these songs live, I'm just doing math in my head the whole time. I'm just like, okay, <laughs> one, two. Yeah. And then by song, by like, you know, show seven or eight, you're kind of just, you're performing it. You're not just like totally. learning it still. One of the best things about that now is that I think you can kind of, uh, every time we go into, I think it honestly lends itself to, a lot of the reasons we did things the way we did on this record. Sorry, I said that in a very weird way. But um, like, for example, me recording on an SM7 sitting on the couch, uh, you know, working with all the homies and not having a lot of people in the room who don't need to be in the room and things like that. And just getting myself in a headspace where I was very, very comfortable to, with whatever came out. And also, we've spoken to this already a little bit, but not doing too many takes where you end up overthinking it. Like a lot of what was used on the record were the early takes where I was just feeling it and kind of doing it for the first few times. Um, And I think that's where you get that raw emotion coming through because when you do 20 takes in a studio and then they comp the best take out of those later 15 when you're all warmed up, like that's not necessarily where the emotion was, you know? Right. It's sort of at that point, it's muscle memory and you're just kind of doing it. Like you're performing it rather than feeling it. Hey, real quick, Sabrina, can you give me the chorus three halfway point ish? So, dude, that's what I wanted to hear. Yeah. That bass, that bass is what I wanted. Wait, but 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 even the bass before that is really pretty <laughs> yeah, fucking insane dude. too. <laughs> maybe maybe bass drums vocal. Yeah, so yeah. Awesome guide. Those I those two bass parts were like fucking crazy. I forgot about how that bass fill there follows my ad lib vocal. Yeah, the ad-lib and then very cool. The drum fill that transition us transitions between the halfway point of the chorus is the same sticking pattern as getaway green intro, just on different drums. Mm. Just a little little tasty treat for you. That's fun. My <laughs> Easter egg. That's so insane. So insane. Wow, so Zach doubled Alex's ad lib vocal yeah. on his bass. Nice. This one's sick too, right here. Oh, keep it going with right that oh. bass part there coming up. Oh, 
little tension there. Yes. Mm. Love it. Love oh, it. Man. That's sick, dude. One cool thing I remember about this one is we. I remember when we started making it, we were all we all kind of thought that maybe the music was a little bit safe, for yeah. want of a better word. So <laughs> I think if I remember rightly, the guitar that comes in from the start, it's not a very kind of guitar-y part. It's like boop, 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 kind of like that pick thing. I think we played every note individually, and then I chopped it all up. So it kind of didn't just sound like a guitar playing through. Right. Interesting. That would make sense because I, I feel like you're right. We wanted it to sound almost like it was like a keyboard line or something like that. Yeah. But still have that guitar quality to it. Can we listen to that real quick? Yeah. Yeah. So they were all individual little palm mutes. It's nice. That's interesting. Yeah. It's nice. Yeah, it was cool. And it does something because what you, what you get from that is they were all very clean attacks. So mm -hmm. you get this really like staccato rhythmic thing with a lot of the percussive element of the string sound. So again, it sort of does in a very flowy, uh, like wide open song, you get a thing like that, that really like, it feels like pinpoint accuracy and it's nice. Mm -hmm. And then you get that and you throw whale over top of it and you got yourselves a you fucking get, hit. It's a what piano, the... <laughs> a delay <laughs> and a, a one sixty fourth, a one sixty fourth wow. triplet note delay. By the way, <laughs> if any of you guys can hear stuff in stereo, this thing with the ping pong, no feedback, ping pong, and as max as it'll go, it goes from here to like here. Oh. So that whale, that whale, you say you're in the ocean. <laughs> it's just, the whale is just swallowing you. <laughs> Wait, so let's hear it without the plug in, without the without the effects on it. Is it just bling? It's just going to be a note on a piano. <laughs> oh, uh, to detuning it. Yeah. What's detuning it? I want. Oh, it's right there. The. No. Oh, they'll be the. Oh, is there some. Oh, some the little boy. The little, oh, the, yeah, pitch my yeah, boy. Yeah. Oh, here we yeah. go. Okay. Pitch bend. Yes. Add the Bobby. delay. A little whiff. Add the shimmer. That's so funny. Wow. So, cool. so wait, so every time a whale talks, it has to do that? <laughs> Whales actually have the most active plugins running of any <laughs> uh, All Alrighty. All right. So yeah. yeah, that's safe. What a, what a tune. That's one of my favorite ones on the record by far.